Uh, well, uh, it's an enormous pleasure for me uh, to be here, and I particularly like uh, also speaking to audiences where you have legal scholars, because that is forever an engagement in the kind of work that I do, and forever the need to discover how far does my argument go if I factor in uh, notions of law, which inevitably contain delimitations, not limitations, the delimiting of an argument. So um, I also really look forward to your questions, to your comments, because I learned that way. I'm by now a nice old little professor who keeps discovering. I'm so happy that I'm still living because there are so many things that are changing, <laughs> you know? It's like a little revolution uh, continuously. And as I travel around the world, believe me, there are many unsettlements that are taking place in many parts of the world. Um, so let me, well, you already look all of that. And, and what I want to talk about is precisely that, the rise of extractive logics. Uh, we tend to think of the extractive as in mining. You extract. Once you extract, the, the, the characteristic of, of an extractive logic in, in, my, uh, in my reading is that once you extract, you don't care what happens in the site where you have extracted. It's an absolute uh, uh, effect. Whereas in other fields, you want wherever you take something from to grow and to expand because you will need more of it. And when you, when you think of, I'm particularly also thinking about extractive logics in our economy, uh, it and high finance is really algorithmic math. You know, it has nothing to do with uh, traditional economics. And it really functions as an extractive sector. And I'll be talking a bit about that. So it is a very radical and extreme component of our current reality that I want to talk about with you. And I repeat, it is very extreme, uh, but it's happening. And in a way, it is spreading. And uh, some of the research I've been doing most, most recently, again, confirms that this now has to do with uh, the buying up by major financial firms of modest housing complexes, not just little houses, housing complexes, all across the world. Not in China. They haven't gotten into China yet. These are mostly Western uh, entities. So when I talk about the rise of extractive logics, I'm talking about something that is very real, that is happening, even though it is still confined only to certain settings. You know, it's not happening everywhere. I'm sure it's not happening here in your town, though who knows? Uh, we have been surprised. You know, we have a whole team doing research across the world. Now, um, let me start with this notion that we make. Sounds good. There are good things that we make. But we also made this, the RLC. You recognize it. In 20 years, we managed to destroy one of the largest internal seas. Uh, that we have. You have to stand back and say, wow, it's an accomplishment of sorts. We did that. We also did this. You know, these capabilities, the questions that this raises in my mind is, if we could do this, what else could we do that is profoundly transformative? So over hovering over the negatives for me is also the notion of rec uh, uh, recovering a capability that now is a negative, how do we make it into a positive? Now, this is something, I just brought that in because I thought maybe some of you would, would uh, see the point here. But this notion of key codes and the capacity to aggregate, the capacity to jump up, how we can, with existing capabilities, not just take it in the negative vector, but also take it in a positive vector. So I'm doing this with my son, who is a crazy artist, uh, unlike his mother, who's not crazy. Uh, that's me, by the way, the mother. Um, because, you know, it's, it's really interesting to see how artists are dealing with some of these issues. Um, let me start with raising a question to get at the, the properties, the particularities of our current epoch. Uh, I don't know if I can... Do you hear me this way, or do I need the mic? I maybe need the mic. So... What is the steam engine of our epoch? If you want that, which can make a new ordering without changing everything, 
because that is one of the crucial modalities, of course, of transformations. That which shapes what is in and what is out. And we have had such. I argue that today it's high finance. And high finance has nothing to do with economics. I think this is a crucial issue. And maybe there are some of you legal scholars who will disagree with me. And let's have a discussion. Let me use as an example this. This is a fairly known uh, element. And it's just one little element. This is credit default swaps. Outstanding. 1919 billion in 201, 62 trillion, just a few years later. Question, invitation. Think of anything that has this capacity of growth. And this, which I describe, was only 10% of the value in play of finance. Uh, so just, oh, hang on. No, how? I'm not, I lose the plot. Oh. Why isn't this? Oh, you know what? This, is it attached to moving here? Yeah. OK, it's OK. Now, this is another element that I want to put on the table. And then I'll return in, in a more generic way to some of these capabilities. Footnote. We tend to think of the term capability as a positive. A capability sounds positive. But of course, there are capabilities that are very dangerous, that are negatives, that are marked by extractive logics. So here, but now returning to this. So dark pools in finance, I'm just, I don't know how many of you heard about this, but it's a growing condition in, in high finance, in the financial world. And see, here we have Europe and the United States. As you can see, you know, a bunch of these um, dark pools. The term dark pools is not my term. It's a term of the head of the central bank at a given moment in time, about 10 years ago, when this sort of begins to get going. Now, United States, very number one, likes being number one, and Europe number two. There are other countries that are also engaging this. I don't know how many of you, I repeat, heard of dark pools in finance, but they are private networks owned by private firms that are today the main instrumentalities in the world of high finance. It's not the, 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 the publicly known and recognized, like the central bank or the whatever other institutions. It's private networks. Number two, there are very long lists of firms, we're talking business firms, uh, waiting to be accepted in one of these private pools. Number three, and these are the words by the head of the central bank. Uh, we do not know what happens in these dark pools. And he coined the term dark pools for them. So what we see, we the citizens, we see the stock market moment when it comes to high finance. And a lot of this stuff will also have a moment in the stock market. The stock market is a public entity in principle anybody has access to it. I mean, you have to go through a few parameters, so to say. Radically different from these dark pools in finance. I mention this to just emphasize a capability. A capability that is really quite extraordinary, quite private. We know very little. The head of the central bank also knows very little. And there are long waiting lists of entities. The owners of these black Dark pools are private actors. As you can see, it's also entered in Europe. And I would love to know if there is somebody here who is working on what's happening in Europe, because it's not so easy to get the data. Let's put it that way. Um, oh, hang on. Why am I having? Oh, yeah, right. OK, we discovered that that's, ah, it doesn't work either. There we go. So, so finance as capability in both direct and indirect pathways. So here I want to just give you a few examples. This is what became a crisis in the United States. It was considered a crisis generated, and this is very important, by fairly low-income people who, and I quote, 
thought they could afford to buy a house, put whatever money they had, signed whatever contracts, got a house, and five or 10 years later, they all went bankrupt. 14 million house, 40.5 40 million households went bankrupt. That's a very large number. Certainly, if you think of a country like the Netherlands, you know what that would mean. That would be like almost the whole country is bankrupt. 14.5 million households could be, you know, you multiply the effect of all the people involved in a given household, etc. It affected a lot of people. In a big country like the United States, in a country like the United States, which is still living a bit sometimes in the Wild West, it doesn't need to know what all is happening all over it. Uh, Many people never found out that this happened. Now, I want you to think, what does it mean to expel 14 million households from their home? Because that's what happened, basically. I mean, it took years. Huh? We're talking a period of about nine years. Uh, but it's a vast number of people. And it was invisible. Every household could have been 10 people, five people, three people. We don't have a visual on it, because that's another modality. You can engage in massive operations that never reveal that they're massive. Because you know it happens over years, it happens in many different districts, it happens. So many people never really, in the United States, never really found out that you had this little history going on. Am I having so much trouble? Oh, there we go. And here are just some of the figures for closures. For those, I mean, you are, some of you at least, you know, are familiar with these kind of, and so this is also includes repetitions, huh, because it's not just singles. But we are talking millions. And that's another thing. What is it about our current systematicity that a huge number can sort of navigate the situation as if it never happened? Many people in the United States never found out that this happened, that all these people were expelled from their homes. I mean, 14 million households, again, it could be 20 million people, 30 million people. Um, okay, now, here is something, something else that is also connected. Well, this is, the, <coughs> this is Europe. In Europe, but we... They have stopped counting. I've been trying it. If any of you knows, after 2009, it's very difficult to get access to these figures. But Europe went through something similar on a much lower scale. And so here are some of those figures. And as you see, you know, and, and this is European countries with either highest or lowest number of foreclosures. And I don't know why we can't get data after 2009. But I would really like to know if there's anybody who knows why. But again, it gives you sort of a sense, and, and really the list goes on and on. I just don't have it. Now, you understand the language of foreclosures, right? I know it's an English term, but um, other elements. I'm just putting elements here on the table. Ratio of household credit to personal disposable income, right? So you, okay. Now, I want to point out, so we all know that in 2000, the, the figure, the dates here matter, 2000 to 2005. 2000 is when Eastern Europe, especially, I'm especially focusing here on Eastern Europe, when Eastern Europe sort of, you know, enters basically the Western style economic system, and certainly in finance and in loans and all of that, whether modest. So I just want to, so let's just go to this title Ratio of Household Credit to personal disposable income. Credit, credit is a very special word. Credit suggests that you have it, that you can spend it. It's a bit yours. Well, and let's then see what happens. Czech Republic, ratio of household credit to personal disposable income. Credit is debt, by the way, right? It is debt for the household. It's credit for, it's, it's peculiar language. So I'm, this is not my language. In other words, I'm sort of also, engaging in a critique a bit of this language. But so here, Czech Republic, 2008.5 by 205, and these years are crucial here, 27%. Uh, Hungary, 11% household credit 
debt, uh, 39%. So, yeah. So it just goes on. Now, at the same time, the United States was already way off the charts, right? Look at this, 104, 105. Uh, Germany, on the other hand, <clears throat> admirable stability. And 70 is very reasonable. 70, 70, 70, 70. 70 is my name. And so you look at these different countries, you know, I mean, most of these countries down here have been rather reasonable. Now, when I see these type of data, and this is just one microcosm, but it is a microcosm. That is why they're mostly a certain type of country. Uh, I immediately have a few questions. And so uh, I'm having a bit of trouble here. There we go. And so I want to know who owns that debt. That, you know, those contracts that modest households bought, in this case, in Eastern Europe, etc. <coughs> now, here we see share of foreign currency denominated household credit and to a five in percent of total household, etc. So, Hungary, Romania, etc., are some of the, the countries where you had a lot of this debt functioning, right? And, <coughs> oh, am I, am I miss? Oh, you know what? I have a slide missing here. I'm really sorry. Um, well, let me, I'll, I'll elaborate on it. So these columns that you see here indicate foreign ownership of this household debt. Germany uh, owns a lot of this debt. You know, there are a few countries that own a lot of this debt. All the Germanic countries in this particular group that I was looking at in Eastern Europe, uh, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland owned that debt of those modest households uh, in those other countries. That to me is significant. Because, you know, if the local bank in your neighborhood owns your debt, that is something totally different. You know, that's a little neighborhood effect, and <clears throat> you pay your interest rates, then the bank, you know, et cetera, et cetera, can develop more business, and whatever, you can imagine, you know, the nice local bank. <laughs> These modest households became part of a grabbing operation, to put it a bit brutally, but it was in a way a grabbing operation. That is happening right now in many parts of the world, including in, in Asia, et cetera, not in China, China is totally different, uh, where you have using the use of modest, localized households where international banks move in and take out. They, and if you have a million of those, even if they're low payments, it accumulates. But on top of that, there is an extractive mode. It's not like your local bank that wants to enable you and wants to enable your sons and daughters. No, this is extractive. And now it's... In the housing question, I've, I recommend to all of you who might be interested a film called Push. Not a good title, but anyhow. Push tracks one of the major corporations that we think of as a financial firm based in the United States, which in many parts of the world, including in Asia, is uh, buying up huge housing complexes for poor people, for modest income people, and redoing them. Now, they're making money off this. And the result of doing all that upgrading is a doubling of rents. You know the story, right? And so those, the poor, the lower income people who used to live there are out. This is something, now, I don't want to mention the, the corporation that is doing this. This is just one we are tracking. And now, we have all the documentation, etc. It will enter the public domain pretty soon. Uh, parts of it already have. So this is one huge firm, a global firm, that does high finance, and they're doing this. This is this, the this, is, you know, uh, buying up all these modest, pro well, all these big buildings with modest properties. This is new. This is a bit of it has always happened. But on this scale, that you have major financial firms buying up housing, modest housing complexes all over, is new. And 
And it raises a whole bunch of questions that I don't want to dwell on now, but that are worthwhile sort of thinking about. Uh, in short, extractive sectors, an extractive sector is a particular type of sector, can extract even from modest households. So there was a time when a modest household was a modest household was a modest household. Today, you actually need to check it out. That very modest household is actually likely to be part of a huge field of materialities that the financial system has generated, is interested in, and has then generated. And with algorithmic mathematics, as I already said, you transform a million little houses into something that is no longer we see the house, the building. By algorithmic mathematics, you have a field of material assets. And that is what the high income investment sector wants. They do not want derivatives. Derivatives are for you and me. They're out for the high. It used to be, you know, the derivatives have been around for a long time. They were very successful. Now, out, out. What they want is asset-backed securities. How do you generate asset-backed securities? You need some materialities in there. All those, the acquisitions of all those very modest houses, and we're talking millions now, has to do not with the little house. It has to do with asset-backed securities. So you have a real asset. I don't know if you're following what I'm saying, but. This is pretty disastrous. If a modest building can be transformed in something that can produce high value as an asset, as an asset-backed security, not good, not good. Now, here's another extractive mode. So I think of these all as logics that are centered in extraction, huh? in, in not generating, not building, not taking a risk in extracting. This is something that I'm assuming some of you have uh, heard about, which is uh, really a very significant buying of uh, fancy buildings in major cities. The full list is 100, 100 uh, cities in the world, which are sort of the top you know, uh, deliverers, if you want, or objects of desire. And so this is just one year. It happens to be a very significant year because it is when it first really takes off. And the figures, so that we're talking 2013 to 2014, sort of of a year. Now, what you're seeing here is first uh, in New York, in the metro, just in one year, 55 trillion bought in housing, in housing, billions. And that represents 10.9% is growth over the prior year. London, 47. Tokyo, and then it goes on. So you have 100 now. You have Hong Kong. This minus does not mean that this is a minus. This is a positive. But compared to the prior year of acquisitions, this is lower. Now, I am working with 100 of these. And it is quite interesting. I don't know if, if, I'm, I'm, if I'm communicating what this is about. Um, but this is about just buying property of all sorts. And I will develop what comes next, right? But it is buying, buying, buying. Uh, and this is just looking at foreign buyers, eh? foreign investors. So here you have London is the queen of the domain, and then New York there is much less so. But again, the list, you know, and again, the, the list of the hundred is, is quite interesting. Um, now, I must tell you that um, in London now, uh, just as an example, London is an extreme of sort. The, the Qatari royals own more of central London than the queen of England which I sort of find sympathetic almost, you know what I mean? It's sort of, how neat, gee, really good. Uh, number two, you can't see that. It's not like the buildings are telling us, now we belong 
to the Qatari royals. So again, how we are losing traction in terms of what the material world tells us. Because I think there were earlier times when the material world really told us a lot. I think we're moving into a time when between algorithmic mathematics and I don't know what all, the certain elements of our current internationalism, like anybody can buy anywhere, we are losing, the, the material is losing the capacity if you want to tell us what is actually going on. Uh, okay. The total value of these types of acquisitions, which is a limited number, you understand it's a minority of buildings anywhere. In the, in the 100 top cities by acquisition, this is just acquisitions of existing buildings, not new construction. That is always happening. So you have mid-2014 to mid-2015, it was 600 billion. Uh, mid-2015 to mid-2016, over a trillion. So there is a lot of money in play sort of circulating as if it doesn't know what to do with itself. So you buy these housing, some are empty, some are not. Many are empty, though. I want to emphasize that. I'll come back to that point. <coughs> okay, yes. So the top 100 cities by property investment in 2016 account for 10% of the world's population, 30% of the world's GDP, 76% of property investment. Now, I put this, these are not my figures, huh? uh, I put this in this type of separate uh, modality because I do think it's investment. That's the language that they're using. I think it's something else. An investment we associate with certain types of product, productive modes, something. This is different. One result, by the way, are empty buildings. In Manhattan, in London, in Paris, we have a lot of empty buildings. I alluded to it earlier already. And people think, ooh, poor investors, something went wrong. And the question is, did something go wrong? Or is an empty building actually better than an occupied building? It's a real question. Uh, I'll come back to it too. So here are just uh, collective figures. Worldwide real estate assets, these are figures that come from Savills, and Savills is really everywhere in the world. It's a, it's a, it's a money-making corporation. Huh? It's not a research operation. So I was in Phnom Penh trying to get some data, having a hard time. Savills. They had the data I needed. I was a bit in shock because I, you know, it's not my mode to work with, uh, with commercial operations. But anyhow, worldwide real estate assets comprise nearly 60% of the value of all global assets. That's an impressive number, and that takes a lot of people by surprise, including equities, bonds, and gold. Uh, so this is sort of a total figure of all these buildings that are in play, if you want. Again, the, the, the figures come from Seville. Now, one, one question that I, <coughs> as a social scientist, as a theorist, and ask, what do I see? What do my eyes tell me about that reality in the making? So one way of putting it is, what does this all look like? This is civilized London, central London. Here is the Thames. Huh? Um, here are these buildings. Mostly they're old buildings. So a journalist, a German journalist, they're always so serious, the German journalist said, after we had talked, he said, let's go to the place which you're talking about. And I don't usually do that, by the way. You know, I just sit there, do the... the. And so I found myself in this very touristic area, in central London, there is... Uh, and, uh, and I heard the tourists, it's full of tourists. That's why I never go there. I don't know, I'm a tourist, of course, myself too, but it doesn't matter. And so I heard them say, look at these beautiful British buildings. These are all owned, and they are beautiful British buildings. <laughs> I think that's an ugly, but anyhow, most of them are very beautiful. They're all owned by one Chinese company. Now, I don't hold this against the Chinese, by the way. I want to emphasize that very, very clearly. I just find it 
interesting. It's an invitation to think, what am I actually seeing? What, what, see, and, and, and I'm dealing both with something quite abstract, which is, what is the capacity of the material today, in today's world, to have speech? Because there was a time, I think, when the material had quite a bit of speech. I'm not so sure today. And this is one of those examples that you see all these nice British-looking things, and none of them is owned by a Brit. So, so you know, there is something to me very interesting about that. Besides the facticities on the ground, you know, at ground level, which is the businesses involved and all of that. Um, that let me move. Totally different, just en passant, hein? Eh? London property purchased by overseas companies. All of these companies, I have the full list, are abroad. None of them has a name that we recognize. They all have, you know, there's a certain kind of formula that gets used for some of these firms. Now, that's a lot of buying. I don't know if you can see that. That's just a larger London area. Um, this is something that is repeating itself. I am tracking this in many different parts of the world. I am not sure where it all goes. I think that there are different utility functions involved, so different projects, if you want. But there it is. And it's probably growing as we speak. Um, OK, baby, come on. There's an ah. Now, this is another thing that you see in Manhattan, and you see it in London. And you also see it a bit in Paris, more difficult to establish. Uh, the, the New York has had a mode of building, as you can see, <laughs> that sort of stands out. If you go to Paris, you rarely would see the, the queens standing out there like that. I mean the queens at the buildings. I don't mean any real queen. Um, and so you see in Manhattan, and Manhattan is a little bit of land. It's not huge, you know. Manhattan is not big. You see these towers that are actually mostly empty, and by now... These are all dark. Why, why am I having such trouble? That, so 57% of condos are owned by shell companies. You know, this is a familiar bit. I'm just going to show one more. Right, and this is the plaza. These are all very fancy buildings. And the point I'm, I'm, I want to make here is that gradually, less and less people are living there because they don't like living there because it's empty. And in fact, the buildings, now they want them all out, because the building can function as a physical element that can feed a different type of instrument. Having people is a bother. Having people is a drag. Having people means that you have to pay for this and for that. Leave the building empty. It's the best business deal. That is a bit alarming. And now, we, I told you, we just did this huge project tracking across many countries in the world. Uh, there is a f the film is out. It's an amazing film called, I repeat, Push. Bad name, but anyhow. Um, how much of this is happening in different parts of the world that they're buying up the buildings and leaving them empty? And an empty building can produce more, better types of income than an occupied building. Why? Because it's not the building. It's what I started out with. By algorithmic math, you have a pile of assets. Doesn't matter what it is, the toilet, the wall, doesn't matter. It's not a visual thing. And there you build asset-backed securities, which is what the high income sector wants. They don't want derivatives, I repeat myself. Derivatives are for you and me. They are tired, they don't deliver much. They have been overused. So, ah, yeah, they're good for us. So the high investment circuit, asset-backed securities. That is what they want. How do you produce an asset-backed security? You need a lot of materialities to produce the asset part of it. And then you bring in, you know, all the other instrumentalities that make it a financial instrument, you know. Uh, all right. Yeah. So, one... I don't quite end here, though this was also meant as an ending. You know, when I ask myself, as I go around the world, and believe me, most countries and most continents are not like this continent here. 
uh, what are the formats of the future when it comes to this kind of stuff, you know, of the, the how people will live, how, what is the meaning of cities, etc. And thinking of our larger world where most people are poor and are getting expelled from their land because this is a, a thing that is happening. So with those kinds of elements, I spoke a bit in shorthand, but I'm sure you could follow. So this is one juxtaposition. By the way, there is no part in the world where you can stand and see this. I just want to alert you to that because I very often <laughs> get questions, can you tell me where that was? Both are real, though the one up there is a mix. Huh? This is real. But it's not like there is a place where you can stand and then also see that other. But this is the juxtaposition that in many ways captures the future in most parts of the world, except, I mean, Europe is really different there. And the United States a bit, the Americas, because it's so huge, you know. But this is, you know, this very dense, not fully regulated, but not criminal either, you know, the, the, um, this side of the zone, and then the towers. Um, and if there's no land, we're building on water. Now, we might ask, why does all of this matter? You know, so what? You could just say, so there they do it that way, there they do it here, where there are a few crooks involved in the whole thing. But, but for me, the city is a critical space for those without power. In today's world, where most land, we may look at a map and say, oh, but there's so much empty land. It's all owned. There are 30 governments that have been buying land all over outside their own land. And there are over 150 corporations that for a whole variety of reasons in all kinds of different economic sectors have been buying land. There is almost no open land. There is a bit, you know, in certain parts of Africa and certain parts of Asia. But basically, we're out of land as we are also out of sand for building. You have heard that part, right? I love adding that. I just thought about it. It has nothing to do with my lecture here. But, you know, so, so the city, so why does the city matter? The city as a space where those without power get to make a history. And I think that that is very important. And when you look at, I repeat what I started, uh, at destroyed, you know, over the centuries, what has survived? Remember that cities have outlived very powerful actors, governments, kings, queens, you name it. The city is still there. After all these regimes are gone. And what has especially survived are the neighborhoods of the poor, which in a way were untouchables in one version or another. In Europe, we didn't call it untouchables, but they were, basically. And the, the big palaces or the big you know, uh, uh, public monuments and all of that. What has gone are the areas of the middle classes, the broad middle classes. So, but this notion that the neighborhoods of the poor and the sort of the central part of the representational side of the city has outlived across centuries all kinds of forms of power, kings, queens, you know, whatever, uh, is to me also an interesting datum. Secondly, the capacity of urban space, and I'm thinking especially now of big cities, cities that are a bit messy, that cannot be fully controlled. Huh? So in the US we have a few of those, but around the world we have a lot of them. So the capacity of the city to make us all, whether rich or poor, into urban subjects, even if only for a moment of the day. Now, I think in here, in your beautiful city, uh, though I haven't quite gotten to know it clearly, but uh, <laughs> I got to know very nice parts of it. Uh, maybe this all, you know, is, is sort of, I think the Netherlands is special. Europe is very special. Europe is different, really, from most of the areas that I am talking about, so I just want to make it. Anyhow, this notion that everybody, like in the subway in New York, where you have, I wouldn't say the super rich, but many very high income people, you just take the subway because the only way to get quickly to your home or whatever it might be, and the poor, and the homeless, and those who haven't been able to wash themselves for a month, all of it is together 
in our subway. Our subways are also falling apart. I don't know if anybody has recently been there. It's a scandal. Huh? Public domain doesn't get any money. But anyhow, there are moments in the city where this is possible, this absolute intersection of all subjects. And this matters. One instrument in supporting the notion of a civic subject you know, is that, that there are moments and there are conditionalities that make us all into urban subjects. Sort of uh, the notion of a civic subject beyond wealth and beyond poverty and not, not to do with poverty. Uh, the city, and, and, and so another language that I like to use, I've written a whole, whole text about this, the, the notion of the city as a hacker. A hacker, you know what I mean by that, right? Sort of, uh, that you unsettle, hacking is unsettling, that you unsettle the basic meaning, the traditional meaning. And a city is an extraordinary place not a tiny, totally controlled city, but a big city that cannot be fully managed. You know, where you are really, it sort of hacks uh, subjects that think themselves all powerful, and it hacks the poor, because the poor suddenly have also a kind of presence. Huh? Um, this is a bit romantic, I admit. It doesn't work with, with legal scholars, but. Uh, <laughs> and so this is unlike Huh? the typical trends for the post-World War II patterns. Because then you had a, after World War II, there is a lot of quite civilized uh, building and, and sort of a sense of the civic. And, you know, it's a very interesting period, actually, after World War II that happens certainly in the West. Uh, um, and, and now I feel that after 1980, for me, 1980s is the break when we globalize, deregulate, and privatize a lot in many countries. Extreme case is, of course, the, the, the Americas, uh, but Europe also begins to do that. Then you enter a different period. And so I think one way of marking that difference is this very, f they, they have always existed. Logics of extraction have always existed, but we really see an ascendance of logics of extraction. So traditional banking, coming back to that initial example, traditional banking is commerce. It sells something for a price, money. Well, we all need it. We can get better whatever, better education, better I don't know what. No? Uh, but when you extract, that's it. There is no, it's up. And that's what high finance is. It's extractive. So a lot of the stuff that I've been talking to you about actually is very much linked to extractive modes. Whereas we tend to think of housing, the housing question, as something we all need it, a city needs it. There, you know, there, there are deep histories around the question of housing. And I, I really think this is a change. Again, I, I urge you to see this film called Push, which looks at what I have been describing here en passant a bit uh, in, in many different countries, including countries in Asia where the housing question is no longer the housing question. Um, it's a different question. It's really a different. Uh, now, very quickly, I, I just wanted to show these. This is a particularly crucial moment. These are just big trends. I'm sure that many of you are already familiar with it, but I just wanted to put that also on the map. Um, this is one way of capturing a lot of what I talked about. These, these, these uh, the logics in play. Corporate profits. Corporate profits have long existed. Here is the difference. Look what happens here. Goes up, the crisis, the famous crisis, 2008, 2010, it lasted about three minutes for them. And then, higher than before. For most of the people in the US, it was a crisis. I don't know if everywhere, but in many parts, right? And uh, this is even better. Corporate assets. The crisis is that little, little wrinkle there. You see that where it sort of goes down a bit? It goes up. So we have two worlds. In our big cities, we have two worlds, one that really uh, can have a crisis, and the other one that can feed off a crisis, which is a rather different proposition. This, I don't know if people can understand the graph, 
But anyhow, this is 1917 to 205, but it really goes on. I'm sorry, it's kind of cut off there. Um, income share of 10% top earners. So you have a high eye there, you know, and then it becomes this nice lower level curve where the majority are mi middle class households that are doing very nicely, et cetera. <laughs> and 1987, 1999, it goes up again. In other words, concentration of wealth and of advantage. Right? So we have this period in our West. Now, this is the United States. The United States is always a bit extreme, but this is the same curve you see in many of our countries, certainly in the UK and in Argentina. and in the, Where you have a period here, is, you know, this is like after World War II, you have several decades where you really have a sense of the growth of the middle class, more opportunities, and blah, blah, blah. And many people still think that this is now, no. That really begins to change in the 1980s. And you have, again, a concentration rather than this sort of more distributed uh, notion. I don't know if this graph, I'm, I'm hoping that it, that it is clear. Um, I want to end with something that I like to think of as unstable meanings. A lot of what I've been talking about uh, is marked by a certain kind of instability of meaning. Now, legal scholars uh, are very good at detecting where is the stability eh, of a concept of a... So I like sort of this notion of an unstable meaning. Um, now, given all of these negatives, we have you know, growing rapidly, uh, you, you can all read that, etc. This is the question. Who are we, the citizens, in this setting? You know, there's enough negative, and the United States is certainly an extreme case. Uh, so I wanted to show you this map. And this map is in the public domain. How many of you have seen this? Any? I see somebody there. You have seen it? Oh, no, you were maybe saying hello. OK. In the United States, almost nobody has seen this map. This is astounding, actually. Uh, and people often think that I'm showing something that is uh, secret, you know. These are, here are the numbers, all buildings that are tracking all of us. If you were there for two days or half a day, you're in that system. If my old grandma went to have a cup of coffee in the village in New York, she's in there. We're all in there. The entities are a vast number of institutions that are gathering data on all of us, gathering data, gathering data. Huge buildings are being built also in the middle of the country to house all the information. Um, now, and it's in the public domain because the Washington Post, with enormous courage, and they had to pay a big fine because they were said, we're going to put it. And you find it in the Washington Post 2010, here's the information. It has a lot of data. I'm just showing you this one map. Uh, to me, it is very important to realize how few people in the United States know there, that there is this capacity to track all of us. There is an ironic point that I make that not everybody agrees with me. They have gathered so much data that when they really could use it, they can't. They get lost. You realize, I mean, all those buildings are continuously gathering data. So, you know, it's like the curve. Yeah, good, 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 good. And then you have so much, forget it. So they often, what happens is they track the person in the field, you know, on the street or whatever, and then they try to find more information in this enormous collection of data, all electronic, you know, gathering. And I, you know, they don't tell us really very much. I don't know, but it doesn't always work. Now, 
if I may, I'm just going to run through this. So I'm thanking Jody Avergan and Snowden. You know Snowden, right? So this is what we know, and I emphasize what we know, which is very limited, but this we know, uh, that the NSA, the National Security Agency, can do so far. Because by now, you know, who knows where they are. So, when you read it, it goes on and on and on and on. And some of it is so ridiculous that you say, really? Like, I don't know if I can see one of them here, but I can spy, it can spy on you as law firms representing foreign countries in trade negotiations. Okay, that is sort of a meaningful thing. But I want, there is another one that they have here that shows you. I mean, some of the stuff is just so preposterous. It's like an, a system that has gone out of control. Like, they can, they, can, they can enter, for instance, the United Nations discussions, you know, which I, for closed doors, but my God, if it's top secret, you know, it's... I mean, so anyhow, so I just want to end with this. Uh, now, in Europe, you know, you also have this, right? It started in 2015, right? And it breaches recent European Court of Justice. You know, you know more about this than I do. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.